Welcome to the J3 University Podcast. I am your host, John Jewett. And I am your co-host, Luke Miller. Our mission is to elevate the physique coaching standard. And deliver the highest level of competitors to the stage. Let's jump into today's episode. The secret pancake peak week protocol. This is what we have. Joe Jeffrey from the UK here today. Kidding about the pancakes, but we are going to talk about carbohydrate loading strategies and just just the loading strategy in general once going into peak week. And is there certain aspects that should be deployed with certain clients and how do you kind of assess and then manage those things once they're going in place? So that's why we have Joe Jeffrey on. He's from the UK, like I said, uh, owner and founder of the Physique Collective, which is a group of excellent coaches also has a lot of education around just the enhanced and natural um, physique coaching area so joe welcome back it's been a long time since we had you on yeah thanks for having me guys Uh, i am an avid listener and fan of the podcast and fan of you both so uh it means the world that you'd have me back to talk about anything and thank you for your kind words about physique collective as well we've um We've really seen great exponential growth on the app itself over the last year. Um, yeah. So I'm, yeah. very, I'm very proud of what the team has done there. And hopefully some listeners of this may want to go and check it out. It is only $9.99 a month. <laughs> and you you can just watch everything on there if you like. It would take you more than a month. I think we're up to something like 400 hours of content on there now, something ridiculous. It's an absolute, like absolute steal of value because I'm a member on there too. And like there's education videos or even athlete series to follow along. Like you can gather a lot of information if you're self coaching or even coaching others, then like you have a huge forum thread of just ask Joe, which is extremely popular. And you go in depth, man, answering people's questions. Of course, now you probably have hundreds of pages in there. People could kind of read back through and get their, their question answered at, at some point in your long script in there. <laughs> we just hit 2000 replies on that thread. Wow. So yeah. if anyone wants to, you know, do a real deep dive on um, bodybuilding practices, evidence-based bodybuilding practices, the, the majority of it is PED related questions. Like you could read that thread front to back and it would provide you a hell of a lot of stuff to dig into. Yeah. There's a lot of research links in there and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, thanks, John. I yeah. appreciate it. I'll, I'll try not be to, to be too verbose, but Physique Collective is a passion project. It's not a, a profit generator. Like literally, we pay our videographers and our coaches and whatnot what the company turns over, which is how we keep the price so low. I remember in one of our first meetings as a team when we were putting the um, the company together, one of the marketing teams we were working with them asked us like, who is our target audience? And I said, me 10 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and I was broke 10 years ago, but I really wanted to know this stuff. So that's what we're, we're really driving home there. That is a, that is a yeah. perfect answer to that question too. So I, if, if I had a resource like that, like, gosh, people don't know how lucky they are nowadays. Like when I started bodybuilding yeah, no. to find that information, Oh gosh, you were like maybe looking in forums and people were like bullshitting on there and it was just hard to find it all in one place. Now it's just like, which one should I pick? That's really the answer because there are just like so many good high quality sites, but yeah, I would uh, definitely recommend physique collective for anyone out there too. And we, uh, we, we can transition a little to this topic today and a, a good segue, Joe, cause I just saw, uh jasmine she just got on stage right and went through peak week which is she is she done for the year uh i don't know what i'm allowed to say on this podcast uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll just put maybe on that as far as i i i'd hesitate i guess ifbb done but in the past she's done really well in fitness fashion federations and i know that she wants to explore a little bit of that on the reverse i mean it, it ties in quite well to the criteria right they're like a softer look and you know she's going to be running through this recovery post prep period anyway she enjoys the shows so we're going to be uh perusing to some of them internationally maybe that's all i'll say but yeah she just did the ifbb portugal pro qualifier so we've just flown back from there 
but we fly off to New York for the New York Pro a week today. I've got clients there. Um, so yeah, it's all going ahead. But yeah, Jazz, Jazz's look last week was uh, was absolutely epic, and I think that's something that we'll probably talk about in this podcast is how carbohydrate loading will vary not only into individually but class and criteria specific right yeah well we'll take 100%. take us through the the initial assessment then of clients going into like you have someone ready or maybe not even ready but what's what's before you're like getting into peak like what's going through your mind or assessing this client for what is the right approach for loading that needs to take place and maybe lay out kind of what your goals in mind are too in that process. Uh, I, again, I'd like this audience, not all of them are competitors. So, um, you know, any framing it around that too might be helpful. Okay. I'll be as general as possible because there's a ton of context, as you guys know, to this one. But I think the first thing that we need to keep in mind as coaches and even as athletes is it's our job to get the best results on the day. And it's not necessarily our job to bring the best physique that we like or think our client looks best with. And it's a vice of bodybuilding coaches when they would take a, a bikini competitor, potentially, for example, um, IFBB will be the most common federation that people are familiar with here. And they're very specific about their condition and fullness metrics that they use in the criteria. Um, you know, bodybuilding coaches are, are um, famous for accidentally bringing bikini clients in with striated glutes and absolutely full to bursting, right? We like it. It looks cool. You know, we're muscle heads, you know, great. It, <laughs> It isn't going to get them the best result on the day. So before we even get to peak week and discuss any peak week input, whether it be fat loading, carbohydrate loading, drying off or promoting diuresis or whatever, we probably want to compare your distance between where you are visually now and what the criteria is actually asking for and prospectively look forward in how do I edge myself closer to give the judges the least... Um, excuses to mark me down within any of the criteria right that's the very first thing and you mentioned about data collection um and and, uh, and this can be a little bit of a difficult one if you haven't just done the kind of tried and true suck it and see through prep but i think with as with most things in our business if we can generate a rough evidence-based recommendation, try that and then adjust based on inter individual outcomes. I think that's probably the best case for us to work with. Um, and I'm talking specifically uh, 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 with regards to amount of carbohydrates being consumed here before we even get into whether they're front loaded or back loaded or whatever it may be. Um, and I think the, the best place to start with that, and, and this I would recommend starting prior to your peak week. And John, we were just talking off air about being ready early. This is something extremely valuable. If you can be in the kind of condition that you need to be in early and practice your peak week schedule, or if you can plan. Show so this is what we did with Jazz, basically. Like we planned some shows that were no offense to anybody in these federations listening uh, unimportant to her so that we could test and, and see how things looked and you do glean the additional benefit of tan lighting the pressure of the stage and whatnot into the overall uh, mm -hmm. peak week diagram essentially that we're fundamentally trying to create here um but testing the outcome based on a rough evidence-based recommendation taking data across the board from the outcome and then adjusting based on analysis and assessment is what we get to here and i know i'm being fairly verbose but i i think the best place to start because we, we like numbers as bodybuilders right i think it's a a bit of a, a hard thing to say to people you know oh, just try like this amount of carbs. i think you're going to need this amount i mean in my head you know, I'm, I'm a data nerd like you guys probably i'm like that doesn't compute with me 
I don't work with like esoteric or holistic phrases like it has to be evidence based. I I think, and I've spoken about this on Physique Collective quite a bit, and I've shared a, quite a lot of studies on this is I think it has great utility to look at the data on glycogen supercompensation in endurance athletes. Um, and we're, we're kind of breaching an additional point that I'd love to hear you guys' opinion on when we get to prior to the peak week, let's say this individual's ready and maybe you've put them to maintenance, maybe they're already consuming a high carbohydrate diet or whatever. Um, is there a benefit in bodybuilders to drive in this supercompensation effect, which would refer to increasing muscle glycogen storage above what your baseline would be? And these athletes, of course, do this for the purpose of improving their exercise performance. So that's not our net end goal, right? But our end goal is to increase muscle glycogen maximally. And if we can increase it above our baseline levels, then, hey, you know, that sounds pretty good to me. So this would start to determine where those carbohydrates come and whether we do anything to potentiate that carbohydrate loading or not. Um, there was a paper I shared on Physique Collective the other day, actually looking at this, where there was a difference between male and female, but it it was statistically significant, but not to a great magnitude. Sorry, we've got thunderstorms here. If that scares my dog, he seems to be okay at the minute. We had some last night. <laughs> yeah, that's quite rare that we'd have thunder in England. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can hear that yeah that's that's big he's not liking that um anyway what was i saying right there were some differences between men and women but they weren't to a huge magnitude and i think the average came out to increasing glycogen above baseline levels by 1.7 times so it's a high magnitude right and i'm sure if you said to any of your athletes well you know we, we can push your intramuscular glycogen content far above what you'd be able to do just to your baseline diet we'd we probably want to do that and the most effective approach as is seen in this literature for super compensation outcomes is to deplete glycogen stores as much as possible before trying to drive this super compensation um and now the way that they do this in this literature is, is normally pairing a low carbohydrate diet with very high activity uh, and then they, they normally follow this like six day protocol it'll be like a three day depletion phase where they'll do high amounts of endurance work a high peak oxygen uptake is usually like north of 75 percent, and then they'll put sprints in there and you, you know essentially we're just talking about anything that's going to oxidize glucose greatly i don't think that applies that heavily to dieting bodybuilders if you've dieted linearly into your peak week you're probably glycogen depleted anyway the context would be if you have got ready early and brought yourself back to maintenance and of course we've got no evidence on this i'm just caught talking conjecture and it would probably be great to hear you guys opinion because we've probably all done it every which way is if there is a benefit to gleam going through this sort of depletion thing, because it's almost become a bit of a meme and a tagline now. You're like, oh, you're still using depletion workouts? Like, who does that? It's like, well, you know, actually, there is some evidence to support the fact that we might we may want to glycogen deplete our athletes. Um, on the other side of that, we have the fatigue management input. Uh, I, I don't think it's a great idea to tell my athletes to, to go and do two hours on the stationary bike with some interval sprints on peak week you know the quad lines won't be too good come show day um but just by virtue of switching to something because i know something you wanted to talk about was uh was fat loading i think just you know just by using something like a fat loading protocol for three days which is essentially depletion and having some degree of resistance training in there could gleam us this additional benefit of super compensation um but anyway I'll, I'll get to my point finally from a depleted state which we probably are the average amount of net carbohydrate needing to be consumed over a three-day period lands somewhere in the eight to ten gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight so i think that's probably a good place to start as our evidence-based recommendation to test it 
and watch the outcomes, but you don't just do the thing and assess afterwards. What I prefer to do with my athletes is to track along the way, see what body weight does, see what the visuals do, and see if there is a gram per kilogram where the individual looks their best or they're most suited to the criteria and whatnot. But also bearing in mind that there is going to be some additional extracellular fluid that's going to come with that carbohydrate intake. So potentially extrapolating that forward post-carb load, if we did want a period of time to promote diuresis um, and drop off some of that extracellular fluid, and then at the same time being mindful that we can't just selectively pull off extracellular fluid, there will be some intramuscular fluid dropped as well. How will they look there? So you see how many confounding variables we've got and you realize, yes, yeah, probably not a good idea just to like do this and hope the outcome's perfect. It's not going to be perfect the first time. It doesn't matter how many years you've been coaching, how good you are at peaking people. The first peak's not ever going to be perfect ever, no matter how good you think you know that physique. Um, but anyway, so placing yourself... If we were going to put a total, and they only use three days just because this is a six-day protocol that's studied, I don't think you necessarily need three three days of loading. Some of my heavier super, well, some of my supers, yes, we do absolutely do three days of loading when following a protocol like this because we're working in the 3,000 gram plus carbohydrate range. For a bikini athlete, like you mentioned, Jazz, we, we were quite comfortably sitting at a day and a half of loading with a similar protocol like this where we would tie that first day in with her final resistance training session. Um, and I'll note an analogy here that I quite like to use. I'd use the, the, a car analogy. Um, so you, you can think of carbohydrates as the diesel. Here, Luke, diesel you're putting in your truck. No, you guys call it gas. I've seen that truck, bro. That's cool. Um, <laughs> no, because I've, I've got a pickup truck. And um, yeah. Uh, I'm, I rarely see them in the UK. And then when I came over to Texas, they were everywhere, man. I was in heaven. And they're all yeah. five times the size of mine, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's massive here. It's a big thing. I uh, I actually got rid of it, but we'll talk about that off air. Let's. Uh... I'm coming back to Dallas in July, actually. Uh, there's a WBFF show there. So yeah. we'll see if we can. We can meet up for a session or, or something. Absolutely. Anyway, I'll get back to my point. Um, so firstly, you don't really want to train during or post your carbohydrate load because we're, we're trying to get the the truck to be full with diesel, right? We've got to do a long journey. So uh, I, 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 don't, I don't mind putting the final training session when they begin loading with the use of an intra-workout carbohydrate or something, knowing that glucose sensitivity is going to be highest during and post-resistance training exercise. But I certainly wouldn't recommend any training or even aggressive posing after loading or during loading. It's essentially like seeping out gas from your truck when you want it to be as full as possible. And this analogy carries forward to the point of how long can you actually remain super compensated for? So as a plethora of these studies, the longest duration of study I've seen up to five days and the individuals did remain super compensated, assuming they were not performing any activity that was heavily oxidizing glucose. So you know, because I may have a client that we would load like jazz, for example, we did a day and a half of loading. And then the the day prior to the show, we just ran protein and fats. It's her preference from a GI perspective. We've tested it and know that her extracellular fluid drop off just from a protein and fat day whilst keeping water and sodium consistent looks best. But we also know that if she's just laying around that day, she's not mobilizing or oxidizing glucose. So it's like pushing your truck around with the handbrake off instead of turning it on. But I don't think that bodybuilders need to fear not being full if they don't consume carbohydrates the day before the show or something like that. And, and that is supported by evidence in this super compensation research also. I've absolutely yammered for a long time there. So guys, <laughs> you... <laughs> you want to start driving? Yeah, yeah, no, sure. Um, I think rewinding all the way back to the beginning, of the actual like testing the glycogen load and what is this amount that's that's needed and just for the for the listeners right like with 
storing glycogen, there is this osmotic pull of water into the intramuscular space. However, your body wants to balance the total water it has. So to, to actually transition like only water inside the muscle and no water outside the muscle kind of goes against fluid dynamics, but we try to do it in bodybuilding, right? So there is a balance where if we're looking at these endurance studies where they are loading that hard, it's great from an endurance perspective to have that much fuel on, on board, right? It's like your truck analogy, taking out your 20 gallon tank and putting in a 30 gallon tank. However, with, with our perspective, we don't know what that translates into like for visuals. So there's a balance of how much glycogen should you load before the, the visuals on stage are a, a net negative. And I, I think that's when you're also assessing body parts that are improved enough as a whole and other ones that might fade some because there's going to be a trade-off when you are loading someone where you might see a little glute fade and if you're only focused on glutes, it might lead you to be more restrictive, but you might lose sight of how much fuller their quads, their chest, their delts get. And as an overall package, it's more complete on stage. So, and you probably do this, Joe, and I'll bring this up is, you know, throughout a prep, you're probably going to have some, some refeed days that do occur, high carbohydrate days to where if you don't have someone that is ready, like way ahead, you can actually run a full on peak week that just based alone, like from a high carb day, you might get some insight to a starting point for what that person might need carbohydrate wise. And at least how I start off these days when I'm rotating, rotating in and I see when someone kind of jumps ahead a bit for the week and like, all right, well, this is justifiable to have, you know, a carb day. We can test the waters a bit is usually just doubling the carb intake they're at sing picks the next two days in the, in the visuals. And what you might find is that the next day after they might look phenomenal. Awesome. Or the next day after they might be a little watery, but then the two days later they might, like you said, have that day where they shed some extra muscular water. They might lose a little bit of intramuscular, but you find like the perfect look and you're like, aha, now we're starting to like weave in this framework that might work for a, for a peak of this amount of carbohydrate, then the next day they look great or two days later they look great. So it's finding that balance. So, so, so Joe, do you use refeed days in that sense to kind of help you guide you towards the loading aspect? Um, or do you strictly use your practice peak and go off the evidence numbers of that eight to 10 gram per kilogram of, of body weight? Yeah, so so those numbers are, are extremely rough, and certainly not what I would recommend living on a. They're high. <laughs> They're high, really high. It might, it might, it might like for a for a, a refeed day, that might take someone out for several days of actual fat. This is a problem. Yeah, so that would be the problem with the refeed. I do like using refeed days, and I can gleam some uh, relevant data for the peak, but I'm also very aware that if we do see this large fluid drop off mediated by a decrease in cortisol or something like that or mediated by just pulling fluid that swelled into fat cells that have been mobilized of fatty acids and creating this kind of swoosh i don't want to be clouded by the idea of wow you know i put in 700 grams of carbohydrate and look how much fuller and drier this individual looks i mean every coach has seen this like they give the client a refeed one week have this big swoosh down in body weight they look epic you say we'll do it again next week and you do it the next week and nothing happens because they've essentially rid off a great deal of accumulated fatigue but i do like using refeeds to start to get an idea of what body part specificity of fullness we see for example like if somebody's top line just seems to really blow first before anything else or if body parts like you mentioned john begin to skew more than anything else that the individual is lean enough that you can see where extracellular fluid is being pulled onto this body part or that body part and start to gleam some ideas of what to see first in the peak week and things like that is good. But you, if you are trying to load to be fully loaded or something like that, in, unless you are ready, then yeah. you don't want to be taking yourself out of right the deficit right for multiple days. I think, like so, you said. Well, go ahead, Luke. No, I was, I was going to like kind of lean off the back of that as the fatigue dynamics you brought up kind of guiding that decision making because I do think especially kind of what you saw you you sided with like the one week seeing that big whoosh and then the second week and nothing happening 
the fatigue dynamics can guide some of the decision making into the peak as well in knowing how hard you had to push an athlete to get them there. Because a lot of times what I find is it's less about how super compensated the effect of loading is more. So it's about getting this athlete back to where they're responsive. And so because of that, with my peaks that like I'm coming out of diet phase or a prep that was especially harder than I was expecting it to be, that peak week actually starts quite a bit further out where it's more about managing the fatigue dynamics. What I will say is that's typically in classes where conditioning is awarded quite a bit more. Um, because that visual is what you're looking for on stage. Now, I think that's kind of where when you start doing the testing during the during the prep, the question that I wanted to ask is the overlay of the class dynamic in that loading structure. Because we obviously know a bikini girl is not going to take as much as like a super heavyweight bodybuilder. But on the same token, conditioning is further rewarded with each muscularity class that goes up, right? And so how much of that balance between and this is a little bit person dependent, but risking pushing the super compensation too far where the condition is not rewarded is worth that extra that you're trying to gain by running the deplete and the super compensation. Because for me, it's more, I found the fatigue dynamics drives the response more than trying to pull someone back down and then bring them back up from like an actual change in the visuals on stage. Uh, but just be curious your take because like you said, there's more than one way to skin a cat and it's just different perspectives on how that visual outcome on stage has changed versus the performance metrics that we might be seeing in the endurance literature. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you there, Luke. And I think there's such a great deal of context to apply to that mm. prior yeah. to the peak and post the deplete and super uh, compensation phase as well, what you may choose to do within that window and how all of these things feed back into the individual you mentioned jazz earlier and i'll give you an example because on with her body composition specifically for the ifbb we know they want to see visible glue ham tie-in but they don't want striation or vascularity pretty much anywhere now she's very lean on her front pose uh, she gets feathers up the vl her uh, mid to upper back striated but glue ham stays soft so i have to follow this model where we almost get her too lean and then spill her quite hard because she does tend to pull extracellular fluid it seems from the front to then retain the glute ham tie-in whilst just washing off the front a little bit and coming in fuller is that going to be the right decision for the next person i don't know so whether you require that degree of super compensation i think it's always a little bit easier when you've got bodybuilding classes where you can say it's probably a good idea to come in as full and as dry as you can. And I understand there's a balance there, um, especially if you're not following a, a sequential process, which you may choose to do, uh, which people like Dr. Scott Stevenson would use. Um, and I quite like the sequential process as well, although the, the way we would do it may differ, um, especially if you're an individual using like pharmaceutical diuretics or something like that. Um because we know that sodium is a co-transporter of glute transporters that deliver glucose to the muscle. I'll just put this in here. This is a bit of an offshoot, but carving up whilst restricting sodium is not a good idea. Right? For anybody no, no, listening. No, no, not at all. Madness. <laughs> yeah. Well, burgers, fries, and the diazide is a phrase I've heard many times over here. I don't know if you guys uh, get much of that business in the US. I'm sure you do. Um, Absolutely. It's the pancakes in the morning, and then yeah, the like, I guess I didn't have, didn't have enough pancakes. I didn't get full, but I, then I drink water after the show, and boom, <laughs> yeah, and I look great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was actually there was actually a point to that where you mentioned that the kind of trade off with the super compensation, and, and we we can kind of talk about how that's going to you know pull extracellular fluid and intracellular muscular volume, of course. Well, potentially in, in that case, we would have maybe a day or two days in there where our focus would move from glycogen loading and it would move instead to diuresis by whatever means, you know, if we're talking about aldosterone antagonists or, or actually a classical diuretic or fluid and sodium manipulation or just not consuming carbohydrates for a period of time. And how much does that pull mm. down 
that extracellular and to a degree intracellular sodium is the main extracellular electrolyte which, mm. which, which for anybody that uh, listening doesn't know what extracellular means it just means outside the cells it is what we want to rid um, but but there is going to be a degree of intramuscular volume drop with any fluid loss of course we can't be selective cellularly selective unfortunately maybe that drug will come out one day that'll be cool um so anyway so there's that balancing act there right on that on that same topic joe like with super compensating glycogen of course like with all three of us stuff goes wrong like i've had stuff go wrong like we're none of us are are, are perfect but within that strain <laughs> of like super compensating and just what we all have done where has it gone wrong for you and what have you seen to like kind of mitigate those those corrections say you super compensate someone friday and you're like oh man this is pretty blown over let's go whatever that approach was show day still not quite right um do you think of some situations that come to mind and what you might have done when when that person didn't get back to their their baseline of condition um, do, do you know what? Being this is going to sound so arrogant, but th this is true. I, I I don't think I've ever had an instance where I where somebody has spilled so aggressively that by the time show time came round, I I didn't have enough time to fix it. But that's also because I'm not a fan of backloading. Very rarely do I backload in in the traditional, ah. um, outside of classic competitors, ah. because of course, the, if you yeah well you guys have seen my season with Corey, right his uh his stage physique was was absolutely brilliant but you, most people wouldn't want to do what he had to do to create that outcome right um and, and his case is rather unique as well because of his previous cardiac issues and we just can't do yeah. things with drug ratios yeah. and whatnot that would maybe favor more intracellular volume and less extracellular etc but we can go on to that um so it, it, in answer to your question john um, having at least one buffer day for modulation. And when I say buffer day, you know, maybe maybe they're competing on the Saturday and we, we load them. <laughs> I don't want anybody listening to think when I'm talking about super conversation, I'm just like cramming these people with ridiculous amounts of food. <laughs> this is why I reference these evidence-based recommendations. It's like, this is probably a start point. I'd recommend that you err on the side of less of that. Only if you've got zero data, right? If you're in your peak week, like, holy shit, I don't know how much to carb up on. It's probably a, a good idea maybe to error towards like even 15 to 18 gram per kilogram total, which, you know, that's not spilling anybody. Like that's, you know, bikini competitor, that might be a pretty, you know, reasonable amount to load on speaking generally. But then we've got this, this one day minimum. If we're talking sort of NPC show, they're on stage early Saturday, uh, maybe we'd load them Wednesday, Thursday, or half of Wednesday, full Thursday, or just Thursday, whatever amount. Friday is the day for assessment, analysis, and potential adjustment, right? It isn't like, right, we're drying you off now. It could be, okay, you look great, let's just hold you there. Sodium fluid stays the same. Just your normal baseline diet, maintenance calories, whatever it may be. Maintenance amount of expenditure, great roll into the show. You know, it might be, okay, we your fullness is excellent but we know that you look a little bit better with a little less extracellular fluid so let's look at these modulators of diuresis whichever one of many you choose and if you practice using them then great and maybe you begin with one and if you want to if your rate of diuresis isn't going at the speed that you'd like maybe you would put another one in there and i'm not talking about pharmaceutical diuretics necessarily here i wouldn't i definitely wouldn't recommend stacking multiple diuretics on top of each other unless you're quite advanced um more so talking about maybe just removing carbohydrates or increasing protein or increasing caffeine or uh decreasing sodium or even removing sodium in some case you know you, you've got all these tools to to use but it's this constant modulation with that buffer day by the time they get to stage i think you'd have had to do something ridiculous you know like blown past these evidence-based recommendations maybe like and i mean look people do it people do crazy stuff on peewees you guys know this you know especially like night before the show <laughs> i went and got an extra large dominoes or something you think, fucking hell it is <laughs> it's still it's still digesting on show day <laughs> like, right <laughs> like i haven't even hit hit yet um well that's a, that's an interesting uh one around 
the the individual that doesn't have that time to assess after they load and, or or the window's really really short like a 212 competitor or a classic physique competitor um how, how do you change that approach then so if you had someone that had pretty much that day for weigh-ins had to go pretty low food maybe cut reductions in water or none at all to make weight after weight what does that look like for that person because that's essentially is the back load but you don't have a lot of time to to if if they go over you can't really you might not have time to do anything about it no and most people aren't going over because it's relatively unreasonable to get that amount of food in such a short window yeah yeah um, you know, if we're talking about 4 p.m. weigh-ins being pretty normal and being on stage at 10 a.m. and putting a good eight-hour sleep in there, if you get an eight-hour sleep at that point in prep, by the way, well done. Um, but let's say a good sleep, you haven't got much time for feeding, right? Um, and then you've got this question of, okay, do I uh, do I know that dietary fats like slow down my gastric transit rate you know my gut motility is pretty poor and i have to get in this amount of carbohydrates so how much do i value intramuscular triglyceride stores over getting this amount of glycogen in or, or, or whatever it may be you know there's a lot of questions but you you really should have tested this beforehand you know, if you are backloading don't just you know i mean i say don't just look the dude that beat Corey at the arnold's went and weighed in and then went and had a double burger and he's a natural as well and he still beat him so you know it, <laughs> it's, um but if you want to be precise which i think is you know if you're going to prep it's worth being very specific and precise about your outcome you should probably test these backloads but understand there's just some things that need to get done like it is a good idea to have a a rough metric on the amount of carbohydrate loading that you know doesn't spill you aggressively and the rules can change a little bit for enhanced athletes you know if you're dropping aldosterone with something like telmasartan there's going to be a little less extracellular fluid if you're using something like an aldactone that will definitely squash aldosterone and, and not to a great magnitude increase sodium and fluid excretion then sure you you can probably press carbohydrate loading more aggressively not that I would necessarily recommend that. Um, but you, you you should have probably tested a gram per kilogram and know how to get that in, in the window. And then layer on top of that, the fact that you're not going to want to eat right up to stage time as a classic competitor and have a huge GI volume on stage. That's going to be a problem. Um, you know, we, we, we learned, we, we had tested with Corey doing some small amounts of food on the day um, from very easily digestible carbohydrate sources, even three hours pre-stage and whatnot, but even that didn't sit too well for him. And you guys know what it's like with clients with uh, nerves and pressure and, you know, they've eaten a lot of food the night before. So realistically, we're experimenting with how much time do we have? What amount of carbohydrates do we know puts you pretty good without spilling? We have to factor in sodium and fluid, into those metrics as well, especially if you play with them earlier in the day, more so just being sufficient in intake. Not blowing it is the main thing, um, but you're unlikely to do that unless, I don't know how you do that. You'd have to go crazy. Yeah, with, with at least for 212, like what I've done that's fairly low risk, I mean, you could go riskier, is usually the week prior, if being ready ahead and you have sufficient carbohydrate, and you haven't, you know, depleted down or cut anything to make weight. You, you watch that look throughout the day for X amount of carbohydrate and fluid before you get a pump and you look pretty good. Like, yeah, I could walk on stage like this and this would be pretty solid. And you're probably going to have an associated body weight with that. Maybe say if you're cutting for 212, maybe that's, maybe that's 215, 216. Then on that peak week, you come down, you make weight. And then food and fluid goes back in at a rate that depends on how much you had to restrict it, right? If you're like no water throughout the day, it's probably going to go in at 50% of what they were having between meals initially. And carbohydrate comes up to what it was on those days prior to the peak week for the first meal. Assess what brings their weight up. And I try to get them like myself, like up to that 216 mark where I know this is solid. And then 
shift the fluids and carbs around that to maintain that all the way to stage, which that's a, that's a pretty like safe approach. Like once you get up to that weight, that looks great. You can dial carbs back, dial water back and hold it. Now you could push it more aggressive though, but that's, that's where you find the balance, but you got to watch someone meal by meal and, and overnight probably eating as well and watching them then too. So, but that's at that level, right? Uh, no, for um, sure, John. And and I, I mentioned that earlier with regards to the total carbohydrate consumption with the use of a weight metric. I like to track that and, and map in what gram per kilogram of carbohydrate had we gone in and what was the weight outcome and how did the individual look? And and, and back to just a traditional bodybuilder peak as well. Uh, weight tracking over the week is something I like to see with specifically the, the lowest body weight landing on show day tracking the fluctuations day to day between them and trying to replicate those outcomes when we repeat the process if everything went well but what you just mentioned there was something that, we, that i was doing with Corey after the arnold's i mean arnold's was the first show and he sprung that on me like 12 weeks out <laughs> and he was like yeah he was like oh what was it, it might have been like 14 kilos to lose and he called me and was like do you reckon we can make it i was like uh i said i remember saying to him on the phone like yeah man absolutely i put the phone down looked at jazz yeah. said, i don't know how we're gonna fucking do this <laughs> <laughs> but he did it but but the problem was linearly driving him into that show where he landed at the cap like there was no room for error you know like he was eating nothing on weighing day so we had no data but it was an awesome data collection process for us there where we were weighing between meals i was there with him i was able to look at him he posed in between meals just lightly collect data take photos collate all of this after the fact and from there we were peaking on easy mode because we did adjust things just slightly around food consumption on show day total amount of carbohydrate can food, uh, consumed some food sources that we know just slowed him down a little bit and then bam you know the formula was there and uh, mm -hmm. it was a rinse and repeat for that um, so most definitely, John, I'm, I'm a fan of that. If you've got leverage to do so. In, in yeah. the reality, it's, it's, it's nice to talk about, yeah, practicing your peak and, uh, the, the times that actually happens is pretty rare. Usually you go into your first show and you're having to just collect data. Then by the second show, you can dial that in a bit, bit more, especially like if you're in a weight class where you need to cut that much, like 14 kilo is a lot. So you won't have the luxury of being like, yeah, I could eat at maintenance the week prior to peak week and then just pull down like five pounds. That's nothing. Uh, but pull down like more than that. Like, yeah, you're not going to have that, those luxuries for those certain individuals. For sure. And Luke, you mentioned earlier, like the fatigue cost. Like if I said to Corey, well, we're going to hammer you into the floor. So you're already a week early. It's like he would have to exist at that body fat for an additional week of what ended up being a six week period. And he had to get skin down to get there. It's like, it's probably not worth the trade-off in that data that we could just collate from the first show and move on to other qualifiers. You know? This is this is why I push timelines so hard on people ahead of time is I'm always wanting that tester show to run that data around a show day. Because um, I've just found, and you pointed this out, like the dynamic of how a client handles a show like, are they pacing around when they're getting their, after they get their tan while, or while they're waiting? What do they do kind of managing that schedule of waking up early to get their last tan before show day, all those kind of dynamics? It's such a valuable piece going into the show that quote unquote actually matters, which for most of the athletes is like the pro qualifiers or whatever it may be. Even to the point where with my pro athletes, like I'll pick a smaller show they didn't really want to do just to kind of run that dynamic so that we can get, you know, some data back on that. Right. And I think it's such a valuable piece because you can steer, steer away from driving the fatigue dynamic so high that you get an unresponsive athlete when it's time to, to load. Most definitely, man. hundred percent agreed. And that's exactly what I've done with jazz at the start of this season. And it works so well. Uh, Joe, for, so, uh, people would probably want to know because on peak week, a lot of people get excited about carb sources and what's going to be going in. And mm -hmm. you mentioned, you know, like for the, this, the amount of carb that might go in for someone, do you have strategies that you start bringing in foods that you hadn't used in other parts of prep or just what's the general approach down to maybe some specific 
unique situations around carb sources utilized? Yeah, so we get a little bit more into the realms of what we were just talking about with leveraging. You know, what position do you have to leverage things? If you've got three days to load and you haven't got a weight cap, it's probably not going to be the biggest issue if you eat some sweet potato and you get a little bit of GI discomfort. If you're a classic competitor that needs to gain 2,000 grams of carbs in six hours and you get GI distress at the get-go, it's not going to be good. Um, general recommendation, best case recommendation, I'm sure everybody would say this was don't move away from food sources that you've been consuming for the entirety of your prep and especially don't get interested by high volume, low calorie food sources here. Or don't start consuming carbohydrate sources with a very high volume of water without accounting for that in your total daily fluid intake, especially if you're going to start modulating fluid and sodium. Um, you know, people may not realize how, you know, if you're making a, I don't know, a 200 gram cream of rice meal with 900 grams of fluid, that's a hell of a lot of fluid shaking in there. And then you drink a liter with the meal. Don't be surprised if your diuresis flies through the roof from there you can get a lot of fluid pulled into the intestine as well and cause a great deal of gi distress so just be mindful of those things but general best case recommendations are always going to be things that you know that you can digest well it doesn't matter if you're hungry through the load you know and, and just to mention that the kind of pairing up of fructose and glucose does appear to have a little bit of a potentiating effect on glucose disposal into the muscle cell as well well I would hope that most individuals are consuming fructose sources later stage in prep. I know how it goes. Many of you may have been zero carbohydrate for a period of time, but I'm sure that you've consumed carbohydrates at some point in your life. Um, there, there will be food sources that you know digest very easily for you, specifically for classic competitors that are cramming high amounts of food, nor super heavies. Stick to those. And also a worthy mention for um, something that... Something that we uh, we relied on heavily with Corey is a carbohydrate liquid source, a liquid source of carbohydrates that we know works well. Um, and he tried highly bronchocyclic dextrin, right? Not a good move, right? High molecular weight, pulled a lot of fluid into the GI. So what we ended up doing was uh, we went with a uh, dextrose, a combination of dextrose and fructose. And we were tracking diligently already the exact amount of fluid that he was consuming every day. So we had X amount of fluid to get in over the period for Y amount of carbohydrates. And we just portioned a good deal of carbohydrates to this dextrose fructose combo. And it, it was a dream because he had to drink the fluid anyway. Might as well put that very easily digestible carbohydrate in there alongside the food that he was consuming. And that really helped get additional carbohydrate in during the load. So uh, I, I've seen very little GI distress from clients with something like dextrose or a dextrose fructose mix, as long as it's mixed with a sufficient amount of fluid. So this would be for individuals that aren't uh, restricting fluid, which you shouldn't be when you're carbohydrate loading anyway. Um, that That's something that's worked very well. You brought up fructose and the carb load, like pairing it with just regular starch carbohydrate. Uh, for for those fruit aspects, for one, it brings to mind, you know, what you talked about the extracellular main ion is, is sodium and intracellular is you know, potassium, magnesium. I'd want to know, for one, are you actually tracking milligram amounts of those? But then also from another point is that bring if you do bring in fruit, I'm interested to know like, what might be some go-tos for you. But then also the consideration around, hey, those also bring in magnesium and potassium, which might also help with the glycogen loading process. Um, yep. So I, I did a post on this on Physique Collective, actually. I, uh, there's two separate posts. One about magnesium's effects as a co-transporter for insulin. So as you said, works very well to potentiate glucose loading. Um, and what was the other one you mentioned? Potassium, right? So potassium is something that I track for the duration of a whole prep. It was funny with Corey because we were, I keep mentioning Corey, sound like a fanboy on this podcast. Because we, we were in the US, right? And we were like grabbing these food sources from uh, Walmart and I had chronometer open and I was just going through each thing, inputting it, 
you know, okay, we'll we'll pick this up and put this in here and da 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 da. So we were logging as we kind of went on chronometer. Potassium is something that I try to keep stable generally. Potassium sodium fluid, I, I just try to keep stable between days. And yes, you can accidentally overconsume potassium quite easily if you move to something like this. But generally, my my athletes are consuming a a relatively high sodium and a relatively high potassium for multiple weeks prior to the show. I know Corey was at an eight. Uh, I think it was like seven to eight gram sodium, five gram potassium, six liter fluid. I'm sure I got that right. Corey, if I did, that's how much I know you're programming. Um, so so all we did was keep it stable and all that required was just a modulation down of his vegetable intake. And there was a reduction in direct proteins, which brought about a pretty significant decrease in potassium also. So it was quite easily mediated. And that's something that I would generally do in a carb loading protocol anyway. I wouldn't necessarily remove non-starchy veggies entirely if that skewed off fiber intake drastically, which yeah. generally if you're consuming a good bolus of fruit with each meal, it, it won't. Yeah. Um, but keeping potassium stable is, is what I would generally recommend. Yeah, it does seem like some shifts because we we had a uh, Callum on, you know, and he was – we were saying like about tracking potassium and, and he was one that once it's kind of set, it just doesn't deviate that much, but also seeing like, Hey, if we had the day, like a day of loading that you didn't have a lot of potassium sources in, it doesn't seem to like drastically affect the load or at least for the, the means of how we're using it for, you know, bodybuilding. Um, but you know, with, with that being said, do you have certain fruit sources that, are more ideal than other because some we bring about food mop, you know, these uh, gas forming fibers from certain fruits that might be problematic. Ideally it's stuff you've used before and you know what sits well, but do you have, do you have some good go-to ones you like to program in? Yeah. You, you just reminded me of something actually where, and I will come to answer your question because this is a complete offshoot because you mentioned things you've used before. And, and I think actually being aware of things that your clients enjoy to eat is a very important input. Yeah. Uh, and also palate changing is something that I've used with great success over loads. And I learned this all credit to Dean McKillop from Flex Success. You guys probably know Dean, super, yeah. super intelligent coach. I actually just, he just lived with us for the last two weeks. Um, so shifting between savory and sweet meals is something that I've used to be able to get in a great deal amount of food, you know, changing the palate between meals to the degree that I've been able to hop between the two, not even separate out meals and keep food going in. Uh, and also foods that the client enjoys. If you can get that enzymatic salivary response, uh, foods that smell good, that they like, but can still digest well, you know, there's a little bit of the trade-off here. Maybe it's including a muffin alongside a very low fluid cream of rice meal or something or bagels with a cookie or whatever, you know, whatever it may be, assuming that uh, the GI doesn't skew. I think this is really favorable stuff. Anyway, let me get back to your question, John, about fruit. Uh, th there is some data on, and you'd have seen this on dark skin berries, potentiating insulin sensitivity. What magnitude yeah. of, of effect does that have on a bodybuilder that's already super insulin super sensitive insulin. and peel out of their brain? <laughs> God knows, I don't know. But, you know, uh, perfection is always cool. Um, but I, I do like dark skin berries in general because they seem to be handled well by individuals yeah. for the most part. Um, and we can also look at, like, fairly high-calorie uh, dark skin berries, like uh, uh, dark sweet cherries, for example. Uh, very low volume, high carbohydrate, high fructose source of fruit, which is great. Um, and then I quite like using... Um, especially in individuals that have the carbohydrate load quite heavily, dried fruit like dates is an excellent selection, man. You make a, a cream of rice with dates and honey. Holy moly, you can cram 400 gram carbohydrate on that bad boy in, in, in a tiny Tupperware box, man, uh, and oh, man. cram potassium in there and fructose very, very well and fiber. Sounds delicious. <laughs> that's yeah to you right now john that's probably sounding good my man there, there is no better fruit on cream of rice than dates that's for sure yeah i, I want to hit one more thing joe and i know we're coming up on time um because the fat we we it's just so much to even get into because we could talk just to probably about the fat loading aspect but 
for someone, so let, let's just like touch on it a little bit. I think the food source aspect will be kind of cool to talk about, but um, you know, for someone that if you took them through this approach where the beginning of the week, you're going to do this slight depletion occurs, you're going to move, move, remove carbohydrate or very low and just go protein fats. And you, I, I've seen you go pretty high in fats to accomplish what you need to. And the food sources around that, do those ever run into GI issues to where a fat load might not be the best suited for across the board for everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me just provide brief context and I'll try not to be too lengthy here. So we, we, we have, have spoken about the fat load as a means to potentiate carbohydrate loading, which I think is a, is a good idea. But we also must not lose sight of the fact that there are intramuscular triglyceride stores in skeletal muscle. So if you're going to speak in technicalities of how can I be as full as possible, if that's your goal, then it's probably a good idea to consume or over consume, if you want to deem it that way, dietary fats. Saying that, there's not a great deal of good data that I can find on the intramuscular triglyceride content of human muscle. There's some stuff on rodents. Uh, the, let, stuff let's you, say. the stuff you find, it's 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 low. It's like maybe less than one percent of total muscle. Hey, well, might, but uh, uh, it could add up, right? Well, well, one percent on a 250 pound bodybuilder. It, you know, I don't know what their dry skeletal muscle weight would be, but it might equate up to like two pounds of stage weight, man, you know, and I'll take that all day just to <laughs> consume some additional fats. Um, yeah. But anyway, the, the primary cause is going to be yeah. potentiating carbohydrate loading for sure. Um, yeah. And again, to what magnitude of effect that, that does that have on somebody already super insulin sensitive and glycogen depleted? Fuck knows. Uh, but it might be a good idea. Um, so food sources on fat loading days. So generally, if we're talking energy balance wise, shifting a client to maintenance or maintaining their current maintenance energy balance is what I would do. Protein would stay the same. I would just rid them of additional dietary carbohydrate intake and fill in the remaining calories with fats. I have never personally seen GI issues with fat loading mm. protocols, but I'm very strict with the fat sources that we use. They're good quality data that shows that polyunsaturates and monounsaturates do potentiate insulin sensitivity very well saturates don't um in fact there's data on blunting insulin sensitivity with uh high intakes of of saturated fats although we'd have to apply context um and we're like obese individuals with high yes. surpluses. yeah <laughs> yeah that's yeah, a lot yeah. of Rhonda, Rhonda patrick stuff she talks about like the combination of saturated fat with the carbohydrate consumption yeah. Uh, so again, probably an, uh, a research area that doesn't apply to as well. But I think best case practices, again, you know, if you put in the effort in, you might as well. But the point is, from a digestibility standpoint, I've not personally seen issues with individuals that um, have switched to polyunsaturates and monounsaturates. There, there, there's a little bit of data that shows individuals that are on ketogenic diets and are quote unquote fat adapted almost have maladaptations to loading carbohydrates. I'm not something that I've personally ever seen in a bodybuilding cohort, but that might be something to consider that you don't want to do this for like a long stretch of time. Like if, if you're able to go to maintenance calories early, like I wouldn't recommend just going to some kind of ketogenic diet, you know, to, to potentiate your carb loading even more. Like I'd probably say a maximum of three days I would, I would do this for. Um, but yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen any GI issues with a switch to this when just nailing down nutrient dense polyunsaturates and monounsaturates. I think the overconsumption of these intercaloric surplus would probably indicate an issue. And just to give like con context to people out there, like for those like example, of, cause people are like, what are you talking about? Pufa and Mufas, Joe, uh, what, what might be some examples of the, those food sources that you use? Like you're adding extra olive oil onto these meals, um, Mac nut oil, um, we're using avo avocado nuts, Avocado, no, yep, you've nailed all off all, all of my favorites in there, and some fatty fish as well is excellent. Okay. I don't think it's going to be a big deal if you if you have some dark chocolate on that day, or if you have some whole eggs on those days. I don't think it's going to spoil your ability to partition carbohydrates or something. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, avocado, extra virgin olive oil, mac nut oil, some fatty fish is is excellent. Quite palatable. Yeah, I was about to say that sounds good. I might have to go make me a Chipotle bowl here in a second. 
I, I think, just, go ahead. I, I think that puts it into perspective when you think of those food sources. Like, when was the last time you had a fillet of salmon and was like, oh my God, you know, my gut. <laughs> You know, but you can probably imagine eating like 12 whole eggs or a bar of chocolate and being like, fuck, you know? <laughs> yeah. I I do have a, a, a quick follow-up on that and the side-by-side -side comparison of fat loading versus not and how much you feel that actually changes the individual's visual. Yeah, so I, 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 again, I, I don't know, but I, I'll put in something here that is complete anecdote that I have no data to support. But in female clients, I've noticed a great magnitude of effect with fat loading. And I actually put up a, a before and after fat loading of my wife from um, when she won the PCA overalls a few weeks ago. Um, when she won the PCA, when she won the overall at the PCA Bedford, I was trying to say that. Um and there's such a significant difference, not only in drop off of extracellular fluid, which would just be expected from a removal of carbohydrate, um, but fullness that she sees through spots that she fills up on first is is uh, is notable. And this is something that I, I wonder, I hypothesize, you know, we know that women do seem to mobilize more fatty acids for activity the men, I just wonder if their intramuscular triglyceride stores are somehow adapted to have a greater capacity or something. I mean, I, I am just talking out my ass at this point, but I, I can <laughs> see that, you know, the, the purely from the loading perspective in, in men, especially very muscular men, and potentially some adaptations that happen over time to be more open to partition glucose or something, I don't see a great magnitude of effect on the physique other than some extracellular fluid drop off. Um, but in females, most definitely, and many times before, I've seen a pretty shift up in, in fullness. I think it does open the opportunities to find that too. Because I have I have had some clients where the carb loads just it, it just goes it just goes more negative. But then when I see them in higher fats, they really pop and have the best look. And I think if you at least have this approach where hey, let's let's be open to do a fat load you might find some clients actually do better with it than, than a carb load. So setting that up. Sorry, John, I don't think there's any harm by doing it. If you follow a kind of sequential methodology either, you know, I, uh, a lot of the consultations I do because I mean, many years ago, I kind of built my name coaching in the UK from peaking people's clients. It was like a service I used to do and I, I became quite well known for it that sounds so arrogant but it was like something i was like looked at as being good at and and i ended up doing a lot of consultations and mentorships around teaching people to peak and i think people look at peak week like this esoteric thing that's like really complicated and i think it's because they look at it as a single structure rather than if we break down the goals of each piece you can make it very very simple uh, and if we said okay well you know maybe the first part of this peak is our loading like we can fat load and if it works and if it has a great effect on the physique or whatever then great if it doesn't it doesn't matter because sequentially we're coming on to carbohydrate loading anyway and you know and then we get that single goal done where we're not thinking about anything else and then if needed diuresis or whatever here you know separating them out so just having that fat load in there i, I don't think there's a cost but there's a potential benefit well that's excellent i think I think that wraps it up good of like the, sequ the sequential effects of how you could assess someone throughout a peak week of using fats, carbohydrates, and enough time to assess after the carb load mm -hmm. to then diurese and bring someone into the, the harder, crisp look that needs to happen. Um, I, I know we're kind of running out of time here, Joe, so I want to give you a moment. I know you've already talked about Physique Collective, but anything else that you wanted to bring up for – listeners to know about things that might be upcoming for you or just where they can um, see more of your content. No, we, I'll put the physique collective website in the show notes below, but maybe your, your IG or whatever else you might have. Thank you very much. Yes. My Instagram is at Joe underscore physique collective. All of my content goes through there. And I normally do the collaborator thing with physique collective, which is at physique collective. So our app is literally all encompassing. We've got, <laughs> everything you can imagine on there. We've also got a free trial. You can buy yearly, you can buy monthly, you can buy annually. 
It's very reasonably priced. We've got hundreds of videos. We've got thousands of forum posts. We've got a uh, posing section. We've got female section. We've got a uh, section for coaches discussing finances and Excel graph breakdowns. We've got exercise demonstrations from an RTS qualified um, biomechanist. You know, we've got everything you can imagine there. So even if you just sign up to the free trial and then have a look and cancel, it's cool if you uh, glean something useful from it. Um, in terms of things coming up for me, if anyone is at any shows this year, I'm probably going to be there. Uh, so <laughs> please, please. <laughs> the world traveler. Please come and say hello. And I'm not sure when this is coming out, but if you're at the New York Pro, come down. It's going to be a good time. Uh, or, or any other shows after that, especially if they're in the UK. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you for having me. It's a, it's a great chat. It's always good to talk to you guys. I, I love how you guys are so open-minded for conversation. And I, I think all three of us have that merit of wanting to learn and also not being afraid to ask for others opinions and help on things because we care most about generating progress for our clients or progress for ourselves more than we care about stature in the industry or or anything like that so it's great to talk with like-minded guys yeah uh, joe we truly appreciate your time and coming on and probably like myself like my mind has always been i i am a forever student and i don't know everything and I get things wrong and try to just learn more along the way. I think if you keep that mindset, it does keep you open to keep progressing. Cause if I'm the master and I know everything, that's the moment you stop learning and progressing. So, um, truly great to have you on and keep having these conversations just mm -hmm. to improve and, and elevate the standard of coaching. Like it's been pretty phenomenal to see, what the industry has become and you've been a large part of that and I highly respect what, what you've done. So thank you for your, for everything you do. And, and uh, thank you for coming on. Yeah. 100%. Any questions below for listeners, leave them down there and we will talk to you next time.